participator, and um, I had the pleasure of doing a small art talk before George about the exhibition, um, specifically and about the, the works of art, sort of more generally. Yes. Oh, why are you turning me off? I don't know. There was some. Hold on. Okay, that's. Oh, no, hold it like that. I'm going to keep it like this. Okay, cool. I've, I noticed a title of one of your pieces called Life is the Point of Life. It made me think about the fact that maybe the party is the point of the party and uh, the art is the point of the art. You kind of transitioned in a way from um, being an idol, being a superstar, being a composer, being a musician, and into the art world. How on earth did that happen? Well, let's go back to school, because when I was at school, the only thing that I really was interested in was art. And at the time when I was at school, um, I was very lucky to have an amazing art teacher called Mr. Riddock, who was very encouraging, you know, it taught me to kind of break the rules, to ignore everything that I was told about everything. And I have to be honest, at that point, all I did was draw pictures of David Bowie because I was a little bit obsessed. <laughs> and, uh, I remember doing a, yeah. like a big painting of the cover of Diamond Dogs, which is a really big Bowie album. And uh, when I got kicked out of school, the last thing I saw before I left school was a picture that I painted of my sister which I should have taken off the wall because I'm sure I threw it in the bin when I left. But um, I left school with zero qualifications. My headmaster said you'll be nothing. So I had to move it on. You know, so it really is the basis of everything I do. <laughs> but I think, you know, I, I don't know, I'm unemployable. I was born to be self-employed, to create. Um, you know, and for me, music and art are the same. You know, art is lyrical. Lyrics are like paintings, you know, I grew up with people like David Bowie who created a really exotic, interesting landscape, you know, it, it's, I mean, as a, as a songwriter or an artist, you know, you're not really ever doing anything that hasn't been done before, but you're doing it in your own way. So you're always left with your own interpretation of, I guess, things that already exist, and, you know, I just love making things, you know, I often start no reason for doing it, you know, and I think, you know, you, you fall in and out of love with paintings and you look at them and think they're ridiculous and then you come back to them a couple of weeks later and you go, oh my god, I love it. <laughs> so I think, you know, I want to make stuff that makes, hello, <laughs> I want to make stuff that makes people laugh, makes them feel good about their lives, makes, yes, humour is massive in what I do, fashion yeah. is massive in what I do, although, I love fashion, but I don't really care about clothes. I just, I, I care about the impact that clothes can make on the world, you know. Often when I go out, as long as I dress in my own way, I don't really wear designer clothes, but I put it in together in a kind of car crash way. And when I go somewhere, people always say, what are you wearing? And I was like, well, can't you see what I'm wearing? <laughs> <laughs> so what I mean is, is what you're wearing expensive? And usually it isn't really. Um, it's more about style and, and making a statement. And, I think the work I do <clears throat> is attention-seeking. You know, I think uh, to start with, you know, my private collection, I just did that because I had my house decorated and there was a lot of bare walls and I thought, well, why don't I make my own art to put on the walls? Why don't I just, you know, have something on the walls that represents who I am and, you know, it's really interesting when, you know, when people come into my house if they don't know who I am. <laughs> they see the work and I'm like, mm -hmm. who did this? You know, people are always... And also, I'm in the music business, you know, which, in a funny sort of way, gets in the way of creativity. You know, fame gets in the way of being creative because once you become famous, people say, well, we want you to do just one thing. And in my business, you know, uh, I've been a DJ, well I'm a, I'm a DJ, I'm a singer, I'm an artist, I make clothes, but people are like, yeah, but you know, choose a lane. People in the UK want you always to choose your lane, do one thing, and I'm like, no, that would be too boring. It's the same here. Oh yeah? Oh well, let's change that, you know. Let's break the rules. 
So is making uh, art works, is that a little bit of an escape from the celebrity culture? I think it's the sort of, you know, it's the one thing that I do where no one, I said this last time, no one tells me what to do. You know, obviously, whenever you get successful at doing something, people want you to keep kind of doing the same thing. And it's always challenging to push yourself, whether it's music or art or whatever it may be. You always want to do something different because you have to make it fun for yourself. You also want to entertain people, but you have to find a balance between what makes you happy and what hopefully makes other people happy. Yeah. So, um, could you take us into the workspace a little bit? And what does it look like when Paul George wakes up in the morning? And just so, at the moment, I have I'm renting. I'm actually I have two houses. One I'm renting to someone, and one I'm living in. And currently, I'm living in the East End of London. I'm living next door to Gilbert George, who are incredible. I guess I could say gay artists, those are next door to me. I haven't met them yet, but I can see out of my window their massive studio and I'm very envious. <laughs> <laughs> they bought this house in the 50s and it's huge and you know, where I'm living at the moment, everywhere is art. It's like the East End of London is like an art shrine. You know, I, I can hear people outside my window discussing graffiti on the wall. It's really, really interesting. It's like, just a really exciting place to be. And in that house I have a space where I make stuff it is absolutely chaotic. <laughs> it's like messy, like you can't believe. I keep meaning to tidy it up, but I never do. And then I have another space which is not in my home, which is uh, you know a sort of you know a concrete art space. And um, I go there sometimes and stay the whole night. You know, whenever I feel bored, I go there and lock myself in and work and you know, just kind of experiment, push myself. Some of the things I make will never be seen, because <laughs> I'm like, burn it. <laughs> Sometimes someone will say, I love that, and I can hear what I do. Yeah. So I have to get rid of it or cut it off, you know. Yeah, okay, so what do you wear when you make work? It's not very exciting. <laughs> it's just like, like sweatpants and a t-shirt. Well, you know, because you know, in that space, you're not really, right. I should really dress up to make art, but I don't. Just up and show it. You appreciate. That. Yeah, no. When I'm working on my stuff, it's very messy. I kind of, I go out to dinner and I'm covered in paint, and I, I think it's kind of great. You know, I'm like, oh, I've been working. I don't need to explain why I look scruffy. But yeah, I think the, the physical process of doing something is what's fun, and then you know, there's all that challenge of letting it go. You know. <laughs> So have you had any reactions to this kind of um, expansion of your work field? Like what have the reactions been? Because I mean, it's a pretty recent thing that, that you were showing your work, right? Yeah, I mean, it's always like scary, you know, you have to, listen, I have to say thanks to Kim because he's been a real supporter of mine. And, you know, I come from the UK, you know, states people, you know, I've got a show in Copenhagen. And they're like, really? Yeah, they like me there. And, uh, <laughs> and I think that, you know, over the years, and you know, I go back to the beginning of Culture Club, you know, I went all around Europe, you know, we were, you know, building our career all over Europe. So, you know, it's familiar to me, and I don't feel like a stranger here, you know. And by the way, you know, creativity exists everywhere. Everywhere you go, there's always interesting people that have got things to say. And I, you know, I just love that. I don't, I don't really believe in a kind of territorial attitude towards creativity because some of the most exciting people don't live in London. <laughs> so, one thing that I'm really curious about also is the relationship between your words and language. Because obviously you're a songwriter, so language is always good. Yeah. And kind of song, I hope, I hope, an integral part of your work. Um, and it feels very much like the titles to me are very integral also to your artworks. Could you talk a little bit about maybe specifically also about you mentioned humor, yeah. about sort of the yeah, the very sort of point and sense of humor. Well so for example, Andy Warhol hates me, is that painting? And of course he never hates me, but you know, Maybe in his diaries, you know, I knew Andy Warhol in the 80s, and I didn't know him well, but I knew him pretty well. And, uh, you know, it was, 
I guess at the height of all the madness, and I was young, and I was, of course I loved Andy Warhol, but I was a little bit like, whatever, you know, I was a bit indifferent. And, um, you know, when he, when he passed away, his diaries came out, and he was quite bitchy about me about four times. He said, boy George is rude, he's bitchy, you know, he talks quick to me and I can't answer back. And in one of the posts he put, I went to see Boy George at Madison Square Gardens and he's really fat. And I was like, that's hilarious. And uh, I thought, I have to make that into a piece of art because, you know, being fat shamed by Andy Warhol is kind of legendary. <laughs> so I just recorded a version of uh, the Bowie song, Andy Warhol, because I found out about Andy Warhol through David Bowie when I was a kid. On the album Hunky Dory, Bowie sings this song, Andy Warhol. I might sing it later. And, um, you know, it was just that kind of association with a, with a world that I was so interested, I was so kind of excited about being part of when I was a kid, you know. And I guess I'm really obsessed with faces, you know. I haven't seen it, yeah. I'm a portrait painter, you know, that's what I do. I do portraits, and I, what I enjoy is the sort of process of kind of doing something really fast and then trying to make sense of it afterwards by adding beads and paint and plastics, whatever it may be. And it's interesting how the slightest little thing, once you decide who the picture is of, I mean, Andy Warhol, that's the idea of making Andy Warhol, but sometimes I don't start with the person in mind. And as I go through the process, I'm like, that looks like Barbara Streisand. <laughs> oh, it looks like someone, and then I decide who it is, and then I'll add more to it and make it that person. But um, it is quite random the way I do it. Yeah. And I think, you and know, some titles come. At a certain point. <laughs> well, sometimes I look at the painting and I just see just enough, hello. <laughs> just enough ain't enough, you know, it's like, what does that even mean? You know, it's like disappointment, you know, like, I so suppose a lot of my friends, you know, wanted more, want more from life. You know, growing up when you're a teenager and you're living in suburbia and you want to be a rock star, you want to be a designer, and everyone says, be realistic. You'll never be like that. And, you know, it's all about kind of settling. You know, it's not something I ever wanted to do, you know. I wasn't going to settle for, like, suburbia, although I love it. I'm, not, I'm proud of where I come from, but to me, yeah, sometimes, the, you know, the paintings give me the title, and sometimes I might write a song, and then I'll think, oh, I'm going to do a painting called Ida de Voodoo, or Just Enough Ain't Enough, or whatever. You know, whatever it comes to mind, you know, it's... Uh, it's using words, right? Words are, you know, but also using references to art history. I noticed um, there's a painting I think over here. The three ungraced. What is it called? The three ungraced. That's Christie. That's Christie. When I need It's great. <laughs> I like trios. I don't know why. Three. I don't know why I was. Um, I suppose. You know, growing up, without going into too much detail, I always had like the boy I was madly in love with and his best friend. So there was always three of us. There was always, there was always another person in the trio. And I just think, yeah, freeze a crowd. I like the idea of freeze. It's quite... But it's also, it's also so close to a title of a work by Canova and also by our, by our local uh, hero, Tolkien's. The Three Graces, which is these three ladies from, you know, mythology standing together, yada, 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 yada. But this is like a queer version of that, right? Well, yeah, I mean, you know, I feel like, I guess there is a kind of, say the word queer? I like the word queer. Yeah, you know, in England we say, there's a saying called, now as queer as folk. I don't even think you need to understand that, but, you know, I like the idea of, um, unsettling things a bit and you know at the moment you know we live in this really interesting time where we're over it's we're sort of over stimulated by the internet we're over stimulated by everything we can't cope because everybody has a platform is what everybody has a two-way mirror in yeah. their lives and people you know if i go back 30 years when i started people thought that my arrival in the world was the end of civilization <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, that wasn't going to happen. And it's interesting we're still having that same conversation. So a lot of my work is about that question of, like, you know, the trans thing, the, you know, gay-straight thing, 
okay? All of that stuff, but you know, I'm not, I'm not heterophobic. I mean, I love, I just love everyone, everyone. <laughs> everyone, because without each other, you know, we're sort of, we can't really exist without each other. You know, sometimes, you know, if somebody's outrageous, I would say, well, at least by being upset with them, you know that you're completely normal, if that's what you want to be. You know, sometimes all you need is for someone else to kind of reflect the opposite of who you are. You know, if that makes you feel better, that's okay. But, you know, um, read the room. We all have to live in this space together. You know, and that's the message of what I'm doing, you know. But, I mean, you have been under so much scrutiny in your life. As being, you know, like, a celebrity is always under scrutiny. There's always eyes looking back at you. You always photograph, you know. There's this whole, like, relationship to other people's eyes looking at you and you looking back at them through images. And it made me think of like your work and the frontality of the work, the presence of the eyes, quite big, quite sort of pointed. Um, an eye for fashion. An eye for fashion is one of the works, I guess. Yeah. So that's like this kind of looking. There's a little. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I didn't get off. There's a little bit of a, a sense of sort of making uh, also these celebrities look back at us in a certain way. So, what is the relationship to this, like viewing this celebrity, like looking back, kind of? Well, I think that you know, secretly everybody wants to be a rock star, musicians, <laughs> chefs. They all want to be famous, don't they? I just recently did an art critic, as if maybe that's a good thing. That could be a new thing, you know. But, you know, I did a TV show recently with a, with a very famous politician in the UK who everybody kind of hates, you know. And um, being around him for a couple of weeks, I eventually realised that he, was, he wanted to be a rock star. <laughs> he was just a politician, but he wants to be a rock star. And it's so fascinating that, you know... I mean, everybody really kind of, you know, wants to be seen, wants to be heard wants to be listened to, wants to be noticed. And I think there's a, there's a painting, um, Rainbow in the Dark, you know, that, that's a song I wrote, you know, everyone's screaming for attention, what if your belly gets to mention? You know, it's like, everybody wants what they're feeling to be the central thing in, in the world. And there's just so many people feeling things. And I think, you know, I, I, I like working with emotion. I think eyes, you know, eyes are the window to the soul. They hide so much, they tell you so much, um, they're seductive, they, they cry. I mean, it's just so much goes on in, in the eyes. So I, I definitely focus on eyes a lot. You know, they're really big things for me. And another sort of iconographical kind of moment in the work is often this kind of scar. It can be either this way or this way. And there's a little bit of a darkness or a gloomy kind of vibe in that, I think. What is the meaning of that? Well, I think some people wear their scars more visibly than others, you know. And, and I think everyone has scars. It's not a bad thing to have scars. And uh, again, it comes back to this thing of like, whose cause is more important? Whose suffering is greater, you know? And they, these are the questions I ask in, in my music and in my paintings as well. It's like, uh, I'm trying as I get older not to have a third party experience of my life. You know, one of the things that I really try to do at the moment is enjoy everything. Enjoy everything, you know. Uh, okay. <laughs> enjoy everything. You know, I'm very blessed to do what I do. I feel very lucky. It excites me and it's fun, and you know, I love the chaos of it all. It's just, you know, yeah, it's just, it kind of feels like a, for me a new kind of moment that's uh, about something different, about maybe getting a bit more emotional and, and you know, challenging people with my ideas. For you personally, as an artist, to become more emotionally uh, available? Or what, what do you mean about it? I think that, you know, I've never, I just, I've grown up in public. You know, I've, I've made all my... How old were you actually when you became famous? Well, I became famous when I was 22. You know, world famous, but 
Prior to that, obviously, I thought I was really famous. You know, because <laughs> <laughs> I was really famous on the London club scene, and I got my photograph taken. So I thought I was pretty famous before I was famous, you know. You know. And then when it actually happened, you know, all over the world, it was massively overwhelming and exciting. And to be honest with you, it's only really in the last 10 years that I've actually made, made a deal with, with fame. You know, I decided that... You know, there's a lyric in one of my songs, went to all this trouble to be no trouble, now burst your own bubble. You know, you go out of your way to become famous and then you want to hide from everyone. You know, and the thing is, in my case, when, I, when I'm not dressed up, obviously people are still beautiful to me, but they treat me differently to when I look like this, because it's like, oh, there's Boy George. <laughs> and of course, Boy George isn't a fictional character, but to some extent, you know, the self-portrait that I did of myself is, you know, that boy George is definitely a cartoon character. You know, it, it's interesting that, obviously, I look at interviews and I think, oh my God, what are you saying? You know, <laughs> beautiful naivety of that person, you know, what, what I was going through, you know, in public. And, you know, I've got a lot of compassion for that part of me, but I'm not that person, I'm not. You just still live inside of you. In my sense of humour, yeah, definitely. <laughs> it's like, in my sense of humour, I think he lives inside of me and I, you know, I've got a lot of time for that moment, but I don't want it in that moment because this moment is always more exciting. You know, now is, is what's exciting. You know, harnessing your past is important because nostalgia can be a racket. Nostalgia can be a real racket. So you've got to be careful that you don't live too much in the past or in the future. Yeah. So what is your sort of... Uh, take on celebrity culture today with social media. I know there's one work with the, um, or I guess Billie Eilish is in there somewhere, or you call her Billie Eilish. Billie Eilish, something yeah. like that. <laughs> it's great. You see sort of meetings in the city style, so you yeah. have this kind of meeting across time. I like this, I've done a few uh, pictures. I did one of Amy Winehouse meeting William Burroughs. I've done one of, you know, Billie Eilish. Because I think, wow, what would she have done if she'd met Bowie? You know, it's like, I mean, I did, and it was life changing. But obviously, Bowie is such a massive cultural reference for anyone who's making music, whether they're young or old. You know, it's like, he's a grand master. You know, it's like a, like a major oil painting. Bowie is classic, you know, rock and roll. And part of, if you want to be cool in rock and roll, you have to go through the Bowie door. You know, it's, it's essential, you know, and, and obviously, I. And somebody went for the Bowie door, and I loved it in that room. <laughs> and I paid tribute to him all the time, you know. But celebrity culture. Hello. <laughs> I mean, I'm fascinated because I think, like, for example, you know, someone like Andy Warhol would have loved the Kardashians. He probably oh would have painted them, you know. And I, he would have loved it because it was kind of what he predicted, you know. He predicted it, you know. Even people like Quentin Crisp, who's a very famous character in the UK, even he kind of predicted things about television and, and, you know, reality TV. I have to say, having been on reality TV, it has very little to do with reality TV. <laughs> it's not how the world is, but, you know, it's, it's, it's fascinating, you know. Um, I don't know, I feel like a lot of the things, when I was beginning my career, a lot of the things that were such a powerful thing, you know, are slightly devalued now in terms of, you know, like fame and Everyone's famous, you know. <laughs> you have to be gay. Right. Everyone's famous. You have to wear bigger eyelashes, bigger yeah. paintings. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the more noise. You know, there's a lot of noise in the world. The noise levels, I think, are louder than there has been. Pop culture is so interesting because so everything's, saturated. everything's up for grabs. Yeah. Everything, you know. Very saturated. And the way like it is so saturated, and also colorful. Yeah. The beads and you know, all these materials that you work into the work. It's like the saturation of culture. It's also like getting ready to go to a club. You know, when I was 17, I'd look in the mirror, black plain face, nothing much right. going on, and I'd start adding stuff, and suddenly I invented myself. I saved from cardboard and glitter, you know, because right. that was really, there wasn't any money, so it was just ideas were everything. And it seems like that's even exploded now today. I feel like when you see the images of people going to the Beyonce concerts, and they all dress up in like all this gear and all the you know glitter. Um, yeah, I think to be I think you know everybody gets to reinvent themselves all the time, and I think that's good. You know, and also you know I support people not wanting to be noticed as well. 
because there's a lot of emphasis in the world about being outrageous, and that's because of that overdose. And some people don't want to be seen, and that's okay as well. They might have deeper and more interesting things to say to us. It's not about how you look, because you can look at someone dressed up and think they're deeply interesting. And in fact, the most interesting person in the room is the most simple person. You make assumptions about people based on the way they look. People do it to me. I want to know who you are. I'm like, you don't know who I am. I don't know who I am, so how could you? <laughs> <laughs> I have to, to sort of bring the attention to what I feel is the last piece of the show which is the work with uh, Megan and Harry. <laughs> Actually, I have, a, sort of, I have a great love for artists who dare to work in reality into their work, to, to also work with something current, political. Uh, so that's happening right now. And I have to ask you, just like plainly, what, is your, what are your thoughts on the breakup? Well, let's first of all, breakup. let me just start by saying, I'm not against Harry and Meghan. It's like, I don't know them, so why would I dislike people I don't know, you know? And I think, you know, what people are doing to them in the UK particularly, but also in America, is really at odds with what we're telling kids to be more inclusive, to be kinder, to be more diverse. And then you've got, one of the funny things about Harry in the UK, people say he's using his royal connections. I'm like, he's the fucking king's son. How close do you have to be to, to, you know, to use those connections? So to me, I just, you know, the painting is really, um, you know, Megan at the funeral. You know, that was such a powerful moment, the look, and what she must have been going through in terms of what she was holding back. You know, all that stuff, putting her face on it. It must have been so intense. And then we were looking at the picture and thinking, I want to do this picture, but I want it to almost explode with what she was feeling. And then Harry, Obviously, in his book, he said, I would make a better king, <laughs> which I loved. And I just had this idea of Harry, like, 17, in the sort of, you know, looking around the palace, going, what's the chance to on, you know? <laughs> just from the emotion. So I'm not having a go at them. I'm, you know, it's you, not me, is what lovers say to each other, isn't exactly. it? But the thing is, you know, in a way, they are reflecting back what people are doing to each other. You know, I mean, listen, I... I can't believe they're the worst people in the world. It's impossible. And also I think, you know, the royal family, they have a lot of like security and advisors. I mean, how did this happen? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> how did it happen? It made for a great RT, for sure. Yeah, I wonder yeah. what they think. I'd love to know yeah. what they think. <laughs> Maybe you should give it to them. Maybe not. Maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, George, what's next for you in terms of, of art making? Let's, let's look a little bit into the future. Do you have any upcoming projects? Well, what's I'm happening always, in the studio? I'm always working on new things. I mean, my dream is to kind of create pictures that can sing, that you can go up and as you go near them, the song happens. And I've seen some work, I've seen some work where you can use like codes to get the music, but it would be amazing to create a piece of work where you walk up to it and it gives you the song or, or whatever or you know it, I, that's why what I really want to do is like kind of bring it to life you know and, and kind of incorporate it more into my shows and is that <laughs> you yeah I mean just you know creativity it's like what gets me out of bed you know yeah, just yeah. ideas you know um, breaking the rules Go break them, please. And will you bring more rules tonight? What's going to happen after this? Uh, well, I think we're going to drink, talk. we're going to dance a bit. We're going to have a drink, we're going to dance, yeah. We're going to dance, I'm going to, well, we'll see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> People are quite excited to see what will happen and how many rules will be broken. I think that, you know, drink as much as possible, that will definitely help. <laughs> loosen, you, loosen you up for some dancing, we'll have some fun. Yeah. I haven't really got, in terms of what I'm going to do, I haven't really got a sort of fixed schedule. No. I'm like, I just want to plan. It's the one plan, yeah. it's loose. <laughs> and it sounds fantastic. Thank you, boy George, for uh, this for talk. And thanks for all of you. And also thank Kim, Sadie, Tiffany, Anthony, Christy, and Dean, who are my posse, they're all here somewhere, and they all just do different things to help me be crazy, so thank you so much. Great company. Thank you for all of you for coming.
He looks so nice. <laughs>